Welcome to episode 143 of the Access Noise podcast. I'm Mark Miller. Thanks for listening. In this episode, I speak to Joel Stoker, frontman of The Rifles, about his debut solo album, The Undertow. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to John Lydon from Public Image Limited about their new album, End of World. So check it out. And if you like the podcast, please subscribe on your favourite listening platform, give us a rating and leave a comment. As frontman of the Rifles, Joel Stoker has released a host of acclaimed albums, as well as playing numerous rarest sold-out tours and picking up famous fans, including Paul Waller, Madness and Ian Brody. Now, Joel introduces a completely different side of his creativity, with the release of his debut solo album, The Undertow. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Joel Stoker. Hi, Joel. Welcome to the Access Noise podcast. Thanks for having us. So you're taking a break from your day job as frontman of the Rifles to release your first solo album, The Undertow. But before we get into that, I'd like to go back to the start. Can you remember the first band or artist that made you pay attention to music? First band or artist? Um, I think, I mean, I just, growing up, I know I I have memories of, uh, you know, my mum really loved Motown music. um, But it was more just the sound than than a particular artist, I guess. Um, And then I'm trying to think who I'd be. I mean, one of my earliest memories of buying an album when I was probably about 13, 14 was a Bob Marley songs of freedom like box set and i spent my pocket money on that so i must have been into it so um and i still play that all the time so uh, i think that was a good choice so probably i'll put i'll put bob down one of the first albums i ever bought was legend by bob marley yeah fantastic yeah, album I, yeah that was just great. i mean that songs of freedom i don't know if you're aware of it but it just basically like chronological four discs i mean there's about 80 songs on there it's great so what age were you when you first picked up the guitar? I got into it quite late. I um I moved schools in about the second year, which would be what is that, year nine nowadays. I always call it the second year. But um and it was just by chance really. I went up to the music room and there was a kid playing. It was unbelievable on the guitar. And I, I wasn't into so I was into music. I used to have decks and things like that. And uh but I wasn't into playing and then I see, the, I see him playing and, and, and the kid was unreal. And it was my birthday about a month later or something. So I asked for a guitar. So I would have been about 13, 14. And then I become, and I sort of started learning the guitar and then become pally with, with the kid who was a year below me. And all the while, like obviously I didn't really know what a good guitarist was and what a bad one was, but I knew this, he was good. He just played Jimi Hendrix stuff like to a T. And then, uh, so me and him started just doing a little bit of writing and that. And then sort of he went off and he got into his sort of like heavy metal and stuff like that, which weren't really my thing. But, but he's now Judas Priest guitarist, Richard Faulkner, his name is. So, so he was really good after all. But yeah, so I, I, I started learning the guitar based on just getting inspired by him, really. Has music always been the career path you wanted to follow after learning the guitar? Or did you have other ambitions growing up? I kind of... Growing up, obviously, when I was younger, younger, I was fo- I was football, football mad. And then um, I guess I never really give it too much thought. The only time I made a decision that I want to go into something is when I went to music college, but I wanted to do sound engineering. I didn't want to play in a band or anything like that. And um, But part of the criteria was you had to play an instrument to get on this course. So luckily, I played the guitar. But um, I, I really wanted to do sound engineering. But that's where I met Luke from from the band. And it's, again, part of the criteria of the course, they put you into bands and things like that. And um, it was obviously very eclectic, all the different students and what they're into and all that. But me and Luke seemed to gravitate towards each other because we was both into the same music and we looked more normal than everyone else. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So we started our own little band on the outside of the college thing, and that's how it sort of started, the band thing. I think we was in messing about at lunchtime, and I just started singing a Bob Marley song, funny enough. And I'd never really sung, like, in public before. And so Luke's like, you you should sing. So that was that. Can you remember the first 
song that you wrote together that you thought, right, this is a really good song? I think the first song where we thought it's got something was probably Peace and Quiet. Um, but the demo thing that I've done at home is like probably about half the pace of what we ended up recording it at. But I think that's the first sort of time I think, actually, this this might be all right, this one. I know all songwriters have diff- completely different songwriting processes. What's yours now? How, is, how much has it developed from the beginning up until now? Um, it differs all the time, really. I mean, sometimes we will, as a band, go in and just make music up. Do you know what I mean? Just jam, and then I'll take that home and write write to that. Or sometimes it will just start at home on an acoustic guitar, um, and then it's kind of the opposite. We put put the band to that. Um, for the solo stuff, obviously, it was all just sat. I was just sat on an acoustic. Really, you know, always try and maintain that song should sound good on an acoustic, stripped down. Um, regardless what you throw on it, if you can strip it back and it sounds like a good song with nothing else but a guitar and a vocal, then you're probably on a good thing. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, as we speak, in two days' time, you're going to release your first solo album, The Undertow. It's an absolute banner. Now, you've released a host of acclaimed albums with the Rifles. So, why was this the time to release a solo album? And is it something that you've always planned to do? No, not at all, really. It's just um, I had, I guess it was sort of during lockdown where we all had a bit of free time and we weren't sort of collaborating and things like that. But I had, I don't know, five songs, something like that, all all about the same sort of thing. Um, a lot more personal, weren't really right for the band, a bit slower. And I wrote another couple more and thought, like, I'll do another few and I've got an album, do you know what I mean? So that's kind of, it was never really, I guess they started out, they always start out probably with the Rifles in Mind songs. And they just went off on a path that weren't really right for the band. And like I said, it's too, a lot more personal for me. So, like I said, I got to about seven songs and thought a few more, and I've got an album there. So, why not? That was that was really it. I wasn't. I never. It was never my plan from from the outset to do it. It just sort of hit me when I got to about seven songs, and they're all of the same. That they was all about the same subject. They're all kind of fit together, and it, yeah, it just seemed to sort of happen like that. Yeah, from the upbeat, positive sounds of the rifles, this album is definitely a lot more introspective you know uh the undertow yeah. it, it deals with your experiences with anxiety mental health issues and your your struggles with ocd you've really borne your soul in this album yeah i mean i'm not worried about it but i mean it's kind of i was conscious of not even sort of talking about it because it it seems like every other person has got some sort of anxiety or something and it seems oh not another one do you know what i mean it's like i was very conscious of i don't want it to be like that make a big thing about it but i think it's just good to talk about it and get it get it off your chest and you find the more people you talk to about it the more people have you know got something similar or this or that and it ain't it's not you're not on your own and it's sort of and it ain't as you know there's always light at the end of the tunnel and i just thought that as sort of you know i think it's positive that it, it's a positive record even though it's sort of about something that's not very positive i think it is you should look at it like it's you know, it's not that scary. And how does your OCD affect your everyday life? It doesn't. I mean, it, it comes. I mean, I wouldn't say it's, it's, OCD is like. I mean, it's so varied, isn't it? The um, you know, the types of OCD you get in there. Well, I, I, I ruminate a lot, so I get things stuck in my head, and just it's hard to just function. We've got three children. Do you know what I mean? And like mm-hmm. everyone's got stuff going on. It's almost like you're you're in your own head a lot of the time, and it's just it's a little bit difficult, but. There's ways of, you know, over time you learn how to get get around it and this and that. I, I run a lot. I go running a lot. That's a good, uh, that's that helps me. But um, I just think you've got to understand it. Do you know what I mean? You, I just think you've got to understand it and not be scared and just find out about it. Yeah, uh, I run a lot as well. Uh, and I, I find it's definitely the best thing to sort your mind out and just clear your head. 100%. Like, I go every morning and it's not like taking a happy pill. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I couldn't yeah, recommend it, it highly yeah. any highly enough. It's always hard to get yourself out that out the door, but when you come back and you're in, you know, and you finished your run and the high you get and the feeling you get, it's it's well worth it. No matter how many miles you're on. 
No, no, you don't even got to run that far, you know. I just think I've never, ever got back from a run and regretted it. No. I always say this to my son, like, he's 13, and I try and bring him along. And he's like, he's, he's a nightmare, obviously. He don't want to go. Like, some days he does, but some days he don't. But at the end of it, I always say, when we finish, I go, do you regret doing that? Do you feel better? He goes, yes. I don't regret doing it, and I, yes, I feel better. They go, there you go. Yeah, yeah, it's the best thing ever. I just switched off and just sort everything. You sort out everything out in your head and what you need to do, and you get some tunes on, and you just not only that because I've got three children and that it's a war zone. Um, <laughs> you know, as soon as I get through the door, so it is actually peaceful. Yeah, it's a win-win. Absolutely. Back to the album. There's so many brilliant songs on the album. So, so let's talk about some of them. Uh, the lead single, "My Own War," it's it's a great track. Uh, you sing, I place your peer, but only for the show. I feel inferior with nowhere to go, but it's cutting me down to the bone. Mm -hmm. What more can you tell me about the song? I, I think, I mean, listen, if you listen to, like you say, if you have any kind of trouble with anxiety or anyone does, I think it's all kind of, it's not too cryptic. I mean, you can make your own mind up about the words and that, but it's sort of out there to uh, sort of understand. And I think you would understand it if you know what that feels like sometimes. So, um, that song in particular, again, is, is pretty much what most of these songs are all about. It's getting, it's getting through it. It's get, just get, you're getting through it. Yeah, and it, it, it really does help, you know, when, when you do delve into the lyrics. You know, my favorite song on the album is "Like I Love You." Mm -hmm. You know, it's a great track. What more, you know, and it's very positive. What more can you tell yeah. me about that? I had that quite a long time ago. I had the uh, what did I have? No, I had the verses. I think. Can't remember, but but I definitely remember there was um like a Michael Kiwanuka song that was on um a show we was watching that Big Little Liars it was called I don't know if you caught that but it was, it was the title track and um, as soon as I heard it I thought this is a good song man now I've, I've, I'd heard of Michael Kiwanuka but I wasn't like over familiar with all his stuff so obviously I googled it or shazammed it whatever and. I love the haunting sort of sound at the beginning. So that so that was definitely in my head when I went into the the, the shed to, to to have a little go on the guitar. And so I got the whistle, which was kind of in that vein, do you know what I mean? And it just sort of grew from there, really. Again, it's it's about having too much time on your hands. I like to have people around me. And that's sort of like, I think maybe they was on holiday or something, uh, you know, the family so i don't like being sat indoors on my own was there a particular song when you when you were writing the, the album um that you thought right i'm really on the something here no i just kind of i mean always try and write songs you, you should be happy of everything you sort of write and uh it's only when it sort of dawned on me that is an album of some you know a collection of songs that are all saying the same thing then it dawned on me it, i wouldn't say there's one particular song I'm kind of happy with all of them. Well, I'm very happy with all of them. So, um, and it's it's quite interesting just sharing friends and people like that because there's not really a particular one. You know, usually you get one or two songs on an album. There it goes. That's that one. It's that one. But it's very varied what everyone's coming back with, which which I'm happy about. Do you know what I mean? Because I didn't really, I was never thinking about singles, that's for sure, or anything like that. Obviously, you have to release singles. So, it, it, it wasn't single driven at all. Um, I would say the song that sort of encapsulates the whole sort of what it's about, the best is the Valley, which probably took the less, least time to write. I don't know. There's a lot of lyrics in it, but it just, it just come out pretty easy. That one. I have listened to the album quite a lot, but it was only today that until I find my mind sort of finally re revealed itself to me. And I went, yeah. yeah. You know, is... I was really happy with that when I first done it. It's sort of like, it's a bit of an odd one, but it's, uh, yeah. What did you like about it? Yeah, it was just a great track. I had it on the background, the album, and I just went, what do they call that song? And I just went and checked in the playlist, and I just thought, you know, it's a great track. Mm. They are, there's so, so great melodies and, and, and songwriting and instrumentation throughout the whole record, you know, and it's just nice to put on and just chill. Yeah, thank you. Were you listening to anything uh, while you were writing the album that, that might have inspired some of the, the sounds on the album? The sounds or the, yeah, I mean, like I said, well, for one, that Michael Kiwanuka yeah. song, that's a definite pinpoint. Um, I was listening to a lot of sort of Fleetwood Mac sort of rumours, that sort of era. Um, I like the 70s 
I like the, the flat drums. I don't like the drums to sound like they've been put in a studio. I like them to sound sort of close. Um, and the drum sound on like rumors is great. And also the guitar, like guitar solos to be flat. I it just wanted, I didn't want it to sound like it's, you know, had the studio sheen on it. Do you know what I mean? So I would say that them sort of records, um, in, inspired the sound of it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think it through to, too much, to be honest with you. I just know what I kind of, I mean, when, because I recorded it all, I recorded everything at home on it. Apart from the drums, I just took the, took the, uh, I've got the backing tracks. I, so, sorry, I've got the demos, if you like, um, on the computer with computer drums. Then showed them to Brendan, uh, who played the drums for me on them. Uh, he got them got them in his head then we just went to the i just bought some mics and bought, went to the rehearsal room and just recorded all the drums for the whole uh for the whole album and then i just took it home and just started to pick them off and just and they just sort of grew and then i was just getting everything real just solid do you know what i mean like with your acoustic guitars and everything's solid nothing too clever but just getting it a nice solid track. And then I just enjoyed doing the sort of harmony stuff, like vocal harmonies and things like that, because that just adds a lot of colour without giving you a new melody. Because you can go over the top of melody and it just, you know, it gets confusing or it drowns out the other one. So um, I'm trying to think, what was the question? Have I gone off on one there? I was asking what were you listening to that might have inspired some of the sounds in the album? Yeah. Yeah, so the sound, yeah, the sound, it wasn't really until sort of, it got i knew what i wanted it to sound like and then lee who mixed it we didn't even have a chat or anything he just uh, i sent one song to him and it come back and it sounded good but it just sounded like i've been in a studio do you know what i mean it sounded sort of everything sounded all you know reverb and perfect and it just weren't right so he's up in leeds so i just said all right i'll pop up so i've got a train up and we sat there I explained to him what I wanted it to sound like. And he said, you want it to sound like a seventies record? I went, yeah. <laughs> and that was that. And uh, so once we've established what the sort of sound it was, we was going for, it was, it was really simple for him. In August, you supported Liam Gallagher at his intimate show with Coco in London. Uh, you played classic songs, better rifles and tracks from the undertow. So what was that like? I got asked, um, I immediately went back and said, is it my solo? Because I knew he'd heard the solo album and he really liked it. And that's why he asked me to do it. But I just wanted to double check. Is it me or is it the rifles that you, you and he said, no, the solo stuff. So, and it, I did, it doesn't feel right to me to play the um, rifle songs as well as the solo stuff. They're two different things. So yeah, no, I didn't play. I just, I basically just played not all of the songs, but quite a few. The only, the only other song I've done that wasn't, on that album, on my album, was uh, Stuck Inside, which is a song I'd done on my own in lockdown and put out. So that was, it's not really a right, it's not a rifle song, because I've done all that myself at home. How did the, how did the new song from the album go down in front of a live audience? It was really good. It was quite daunting. It was probably the first time I've been nervous in a long time. But then when you think about it, I'm playing in front of a very partisan crowd. Just to t- they're just totally for Liam. Um, for the first time, my own stuff on my own. Plus, no one's heard the songs. That was a tough one. But I mean, we, it couldn't have gone any better. It seemed like we had the the room was full up. It seemed like we had like the attention. Do you know what I mean? So sometimes, you know, if support bands are on, you're at the bar, you're chatting, and this and that. But it felt it felt like everyone was listening. So it couldn't have gone any better from that from that point of view. Mm-hmm. And in September, you'll be playing some of your own shows. You, you must be looking forward to those. Yeah, I've got the first one this Saturday in uh, Walthamstow, which is around the corner from me, at the Walthamstow Trades Hall, which is like a sort of working man's club. Um, that'll be the, that was the first one intended. I intended to do because the album will be out. So, uh, yeah, the album's out Friday, and I'm playing on Saturday. So they'll only have a day to hear the songs, but I'm sure it'll be fine. And then from then on, I just plan to play like a Thursday night every every week, indefinitely sort of thing, as opposed to touring, which I don't really like going on tour so much. Um, 
but just to do a gig a week in just various plate like, spots around the country, that works for me better. And it, it kind of, you're not, it's just a nice thing to do. It's like a little one off, but every week. And how does it feel being on stage as a solo artist without the rest of the your rifles bandmates behind you? Well, I've only done it once. Well, I've done it a couple of times because we've done a little warm up gig in a, in a pub. But um, I've done stuff before on my own um, as a rifles thing, like an acoustic stuff. But I don't know really. The Liam gig's not a good gauge um, on what it's like. So Saturday will be the first time I'm actually playing. I'm just looking forward to the album coming out and just seeing what people think of it. And the gigs should be a lot easier once people know the songs, I, I think. Um, but it's definitely not going to be a jump around type of uh, e event or night like, like the rifles would be. So that'll be a bit different, but that's cool. I don't mind that. The last studio album from the Rifles was a double album, Big Life, in 2016. And to hear the band has a new studio album coming soon. Yeah. Um, when will that be and what can we, we expect from the record? We're just, um, we're just sort of, we've, we've got all the drums and basses, bass down for all the tracks. We wrote a lot of songs over about a year and a half ago, but just wasn't listening back. It was so fragmented in the way we'd done it. It didn't sound, it didn't sound like an album. Um, some of the songs wasn't very I didn't think they were good enough um, so we went back to the drawing board and just tried to sort of write, write songs that were you know that are good live songs to play um, so kind of going backwards a little bit but I don't mind again I don't mind that our, our fan base uh, Rifles fan base is unbelievable and we have great nights gigging um, so if we can just continue to get the, these songs that will work and come across really well live and people have a good night. I think that's, uh, that's what we're trying to go for. Will it be out this year or possibly next year? Probably not this year now, will it? I mean, <clears throat> we're going to do as much as we can, but it just takes so long to sort of, once the album's done, I mean, just vinyl alone, there's a big wait in time uh, to get vinyl done and all that, but. It's, it's hard, you know what I mean? We work, we do all other bits and bobs as well. Just getting together sometimes is uh, hard work. So we're getting there. If you were to recommend one of the Rifles albums to someone who had never heard the band before, what album would you tell them to start with? I always like None the Wiser. I'm pretty sure. I can't stand my voice on the first album. I just can't listen to it. Um I like none the wiser. Good choice. Why, why do you not like your voice in the first album? I don't know. I don't know. Just don't like it. <laughs> I suppose Liam says that about definitely maybe as well. Yeah, which you, you, I find hard to believe, but that's, there you go. No problem. Um, I like to ask my guests the following questions. If you could go back and relive one musical moment from your career, what would it be? Well, do, do it again, what we've already done. Um, if there's something that didn't go right you would like to go back and change or a, a moment that was just so amazing you would just like to relive it it would have it would have to be when Paul Weller come on and played uh, Eating Rifles with us wow it was just a mad moment like for us an unbelievable moment and I know he didn't play jam songs for a long time and when he, when he sort of said he'd come and do a gig come and play at, at, at the gig we thought we, we would ask him if we can do eat and rifles we was we wouldn't have been surprised if he said i'm not really up for doing that but he did and it was just great it was just a, a, a real moment amazing where was that that was at a forum in kentish town nice one no love, yeah, love paul weller myself yeah that one i mean that, that's got to take some beat in that one for us music fans, music is the soundtrack to our memories. What song or album, when you listen to it, brings back the best memories for you? It's going to have to be Oasis, just purely because that, I mean, the whole Nebworth thing. I mean, there's loads of albums you can get, like Tricky and um, Eclectic, but really, when you think about it, Nebworth, that whole scene, it was just, what I loved about that whole scene was I was always sort of into music, and a couple of my friends were. Most of my friends are football boys, you know what I mean? And that's this. But that was the first time, and if not the only time in, in my sort of uh, 
growing up where everyone the jukebox in the pub was just oasis oasis and everyone was banging into it um it was just a great time yeah absolutely i mean we're probably around about the same age in our 40s i would say yeah um yeah so I remember it all myself. And it's hard to explain that, you know, I mean, my daughter loves Oasis now. And, you know, and I suppose they were our Beatles and we can't, we don't know what it was like back in the day with the Beatles, but we know what it was like when Oasis was around, which was. But what was lovely is my nephew, their sort of, my nephew and sort of like my cousin, um, they're, uh, what are they, 19, something like that. So they love Oasis and all that. But he's so like, jealous that we got to do all that do you know what i mean because he, he'll never get to do that again but then he come and watched me at liam at coco the other night and liam was um he was brilliant and um pl- pl- played a lot of oasis and it was kind of it was the closest thing to being back at an, an oasis obviously no one there but um the closest thing to being back it was almost like oh, i got teleported back for a little while and what was lovely was one of my best friends, Connor, it was just me and him who went to Nebworth. And his dad is playing the drums on my album. So his dad was playing the drums. He was there at the gig at Coco, and it's all like a massive full circle. And we're just standing there singing Oasis songs like we were sort of like 25 years ago. It, it was a moment. Brilliant. I mean, little nephew, I'm so glad that he came there because it's like you kind of got it there. Do you know what I mean? You kind of got what it was like a bit there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you go to see Liam, it is just like an Oasis gig. You know, I've seen him a few times. So, t- like, I mean, it's still 1500, but that's a small venue to go and watch him in, like that. Yeah. And the band were great. So, yeah, it was, it was great. It was just a great night. Just a couple more questions left, Joe. What song or album is your guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure? Um, trying to think that. I think everything I've got is pretty cool. I wouldn't say it's a guilty pleasure. <laughs> the first record on vinyl I ever bought was in Cavern Records down Walthamstow Market. I think we, I was down there with my granddad. And I don't know if I liked the cover or it had the I Feel For You on it, but it's a Shaka Khan I Feel For You album. That's the first record I ever bought. I wouldn't say that's a guilty pleasure. That's That's a great record. That's a, that's a serious album still, isn't it? I, <laughs> since then, I've bought it on CD and I still love it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that's what I'm saying. I wouldn't say there's no, like, really, really embarrassing things that are sort of... Uh, so, but, I so mean, you, that's, quite, that, that's maybe an unexpected one, if you like. You know what I mean? Well, I always say, you know, if you were driving around in a car, if you were playing a certain song, would you have the window, windows up or would you have the windows down? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, so if you're playing Barbie Girl, you'd probably have them t- up tight, right? <laughs> Correct. I don't actually own any Aqua. What are you most grateful for about being able to do what you do every day? It's obviously your family and, you know, people who support you in, in what you're doing. But essentially, without a fan base like what we've got, there's no way we could do it every, every day. We just couldn't do it. Do you know what I mean? It would be like a more of a little hobby. Um so without our sort of, we've got an incredible fan base who've literally stuck by us the whole way through. So without them turning up, we wouldn't be able to do it. So we have to be grateful for that. So that's, that's me done, Joel. Is there anything else you would like to mention before we wrap up? No, I think we covered some ground there, didn't we? Yeah, absolutely. All right, okay, thanks Joel. for your time, man. Not a problem, and uh, enjoy the football tonight. And again, I wish you all the best with the album. Thanks very much, Mark. Well, very nice mate. to chat with you, man. Right, take it easy. Take it easy, mate. Bye-bye. Bye, mate. Bye. Bye.